السلام علیکم ایوری ون بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین ایا کنا ابدو و ایا کن استعین احتن السرات المستقیم سرات الزین انمتا علیہم غیر المقدوب علیہم ولدوالین آمین Welcome everyone to our second Inside Islam series in which we learn more about the diverse communities of belief within Islam and dispel some misconceptions that have arisen about them. Today we are very happy to have Norishia Al-Sharif with us. I will introduce Norishia. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Islamic Studies from Imam Abdul Rahman bin Faisal University an associate degree in financing from Daman University. She has an ijaza in Tajweed from Al-Azhar University and recently completed her bachelor's degree in business administration. She has been studying with different sheikhs and sheikhs for the past 14 years and is affiliated with the Shadaliya or Akbariya order. And she has also been engaged in teaching Sufism in some retreats here in the States and in Turkey. And she is also an avid mountain climber. So welcome, Narishia. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us today to talk about Sufism and to answer some of the questions that people have. So I'm going to start with our first question, which is, what is meant by Sufism? Introduce Sufism to us, please. Um, so Sufism is, I mean, universally misunderstood. Uh, a proper understanding of Sufism would lead to a proper understanding of Islam itself. And understanding of Sufism now, this day, this age, is more important because uh, it, it can hold the key to, to solve so many problems, actually, of the current, the world current problems. So, so Sufism is not any sort of rituals uh, or that is different from Islam. Uh, it's not mentioning particular names of Allah and or like wearing particular dresses than other Muslims or it's not it's none of this. Um, <clears throat> Sufism is the spirit, the essence uh, within the religion. So the word religion, I'm just reading the chat here. The word religion um, might be understood as the outer expression of the path, of the way of the revelation. Uh, it's the external um, manifestation of the of Islam. While Sufism is the inner dimension, it's the spirituality. It's uh, it's just the word, really. It's not different from Islam. <clears throat> it's just like the word to point the inner dimension uh, of the religion. And throughout this meeting, inshallah, like every time I mention religion, it's like just the outer expression of Islam. And if I mention uh, Sufism, it's the inner dimension, the, the essence of Islam, inshallah. Shazakallah, Narishia. So our next question is, what is the meaning or origin of the name Sufi? Where does this word come from? Hmm. Well, there's um, three, three several different uh, references to the, to the origin of the names, uh, of the name Sufi. Uh, the first one is the Arabic word Sofa, and Sofa means purity, um, which is the goal of the Sufism, to eventually purify yourself and do the tazkiyah. Um, and there is another uh, word in Arabic too, it means Suf, uh, the, the word, the wool, uh, the sheep wool. Um, it's Arabic too, and usually, the original spiritual seekers they used to to wear uh, the wall, um, the clock to symbolize the that the non attachment to the word the word and to adhere to original uh, the prophet path of like being minimalism. <clears throat> there is a third name where that the the word Sufi is coming from is Ahl Sofa. And it means literally the people of the bench. They were like uh, those companions of the prophet who used to sit outside of the home of the of the prophet. And their primary focus is their own spiritual development. Um, and and 
they think that the word came from Ahl al-Safa too. So it's either Safa, the purity, or Suf, the wall, or from Ahl al-Safa, the, the, the companion of the bench. Thank you very much, Arishia. Next question is, oh, before I say the next question, everybody is welcome to put any questions that they have in the chat or you can send them to the host directly or put them in the chat box. So our third question is, how can Sufism help us in our everyday life? What is the applicability of Sufism? Well, by understanding spirituality and in understanding Sufism and applying it properly in our life, one can achieve, achieve and attain balanced experience of the religion. You said like the religion is the outer and the inner, right? <clears throat> balanced experience of spirituality, religion will become applicable and relevant in our life uh, and in the lives of others uh, around us. Uh, once the inner dimension is honored, religion become beneficial and purposeful, uh, become healing and filled with light. Um, religion becomes spiritually fulfilling and it leads to a higher set of consciousness. Um, with which ultimately would lead to becoming free from fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, and all of the negative traits of the lower self. Um, so only um, only through spirituality can we approach the divine divine presence of Allah and Taala. Only through understanding it, uh, religion without spirituality is like body without uh, the spirit of it, right? Um, the danger of not understanding Sufism or spirituality, of not applying spirituality to one's life, uh, that we can fill, uh, fall into the imbalance religion practices. Um, and then the religion would become heavy and burdensome and just a constant struggle. Uh, life and religion without spirituality become a path of force and, force and struggle really um <clears throat> we literally unable unable to pass uh any benefit to the others in, in our lives whether our children our like loved ones uh without the true knowledge true the realize, realization uh true wisdom of the heart and the soul um we all know the very uh, like epic famous story of the shaitan uh, and it's kind of the main story of our religion <clears throat> because like a shaitan, whether he was a, like the, <laughs> whether he was a jinn or, or from the angel, he was definitely in a higher state uh, of worshiping. And like Allah brought him close to him, like he was, was in a higher state than the angels themselves, right? Um, and he, he was just worshiping Allah and bickering and all of that. Uh, but because he was practicing the religion, once Allah asked him to bow down to Adam, his ego just couldn't take it, right? So there is no real inner work for the shaitan, and now he's the main enemy for Allah and for the humankind. So if we keep practicing the religion in a practi practical way and without the essence of it, without the spirit of it, we, we might eventually fall to the same mistake as shaitan did. Um, so yeah. Jazakallah, oh, Somebody sent a question that sometimes people see Sufism as an outlier sect, but can you highlight some impactful scholars throughout Islamic history who have identified or called themselves as Sufi? I know that you. I know that you were eager to talk about one special person. Who was that? <laughs> you mean Ibn Arabi or Rumi? My I think favorite. Rumi, both. <laughs> um, Rumi, probably because it's he's famous here in the West more. Um, but to go back to the, maybe we'll talk that more about the labeling part, uh, more uh, in 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 our explaining later. But um, people in the in the old time wouldn't call themselves Sufi, right? Um, it just it's actually a term that we 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 start using recently uh, because like 
one would, wouldn't call themselves Sufi, like they wouldn't call themselves, oh, I am enlightened. Um, but most of like, literally in the old times and by the old times is, I mean, the time of the prophets until maybe the eighth century, um, they would be Sufi without the label itself. Like almost 99, like 95% of the Muslims would be Sufi without labeling themselves. <laughs> that's very helpful to know dear and i think that you answered the second the next question that i was going to ask is that should the term sufi be applied to someone who tries to practice this form of inner work or mystical work do you want to add something to that or should we move on to the next question well, well a little bit maybe to identify with sufism is like um, maybe I'm just talking about because I hear it more. People say I'm Sufi and Sufi, as if it's first of all, as if it's something different from Islam, and second of all, because identifying is what Sufism is actually counter to the very principle of Sufism. <laughs> um, like identification with uh, this name is like it's as if one would call themselves like, oh, I am purified. I am transcendent already. Uh, the original Sufi, and go back to the question you just asked, the original Sufis, people like Ibn Arab, Rumi himself wouldn't call himself Sufi, right? The original Sufi did not identify with this term or label. Uh, the words actually rather would use to be to describe others. Like I would see someone who I think he, uh, pure hearted and work on himself or herself uh, to with Tazkiyah. And I was, I would call them Sufi, but they wouldn't call themselves Sufi. And um, just calling oneself Sufi would take us to that spiritual superiority one would tell, uh, you uh, like feel. And it's, uh, it's the ego again, the ego actually used the very path designed to the inhalation oneself to preserve itself. <laughs> it's funny. And uh, it shouldn't be surprising because it happens in every religion, including Islam. One sec, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, I was not able to unmute. And so. Oh, I missed you. <laughs> just have to learn the ratio for that. And so, if you were to define Sufism in one sentence, what would you say? Because Ooh. there are some questions that are coming up that make me feel like, okay, how can we really simplify this and put it in one sentence? Am I correct if I said somebody who is focusing on the inner journey of Islam, as well as the outer journey? That would be a proper um, definition for it. Okay, you agree, okay, alhamdulillah. Let's move on to talking about the major contributions of Sufism to the world. Do you have like 100,000 hours? <laughs> I don't know where to start. Alhamdulillah. Um, alhamdulillah. Um, I mean, Sufism has influenced literature, music, art, art architecture, like all around the world. Um, um, and um, first of all, we can start with spreading Islam. <clears throat> uh, in, in, well, the Sufi people usually tend to, so uh, to, tend to travel a lot, right? Uh, and usually they asked by their sheikhs and murshids to, to go, to go out and go through the journey physically. And, uh, and so though like Islamically we don't preach, we are not like Christianity, we preach Islam, but a Sufi person would travel all around. Um, and then of course they want to have their own mosques. And then of course they are working on their uh, inner journey and uh, uh, working with the value of this 
sometimes the tolerance, the love, the the non-judgmental, uh, um, the 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 working with the, the best of uh, qualities and being excellent in their work, so they um, they uh, spread Islam uh, through that. Uh, they actually they spread Islam in like Africa, sub saharas uh, the first people who came to uh, the state, the uh, North America, actually, the Sufi Muslims, uh, so, Subhanallah. Um, so that that's that. Um, the the first university in in the whole universe <laughs> was established by a Sufi woman. Yay! <laughs> uh, but was established by Fatima Al Farahi. Uh, it's the first university to uh, give a, a, a degree granted, like uh, university in, in Morocco, Fas, Fas. Um, so also in the music part, uh, most of the instruments we know were created by, by them. Uh, the Qumra, is, that, is, that, is this word familiar to you? Qumra, Qumra, Camera. <laughs> um, also the camera uh, or the camera. Uh, actually, uh, we I had so I think a few years ago there was like the um, uh, the museum of a uh, thousand and one thousand innovation by Muslims, and my teacher then asked me to trace back some of them and see if Sufi of them or not. Like I literally started tracing back who's Sufi of those people. Um, and then like, most of them were Sufis to point where like I, I gave up tracing the other people. Uh, the, the most innovation that actually was in the golden area of Islam. Um, yeah. Um, one of the also like contribution I, I really like to mention is like the Sufis were always standing, <clears throat> standing strongly uh, against uh, colonization and the unjust regimes. Um, in the modern time, like the Sufi masters led the <clears throat> targeted against British, French, Italian uh, colonizers. Um, I would really highly recommend for you to, to look up, I mean, are so many, but maybe to find English uh, um, content about Omar al Mukhtar. Without Omar al Mukhtar, I don't think Libya would, you know, uh, would be liberate, liberated. Salah uh, al-Din al Ayyubi, who freed Jerusalem, was Sufi too. Uh, and speaking of Jerusalem, most of the, lots of the uh, Palestinian actually. Are affiliated with the Shadiliya uh, order. Uh, it's one of the orders that always stand against um, uh, unjust and colonization. Too. In Pakistan, we have uh, Mirza Ali Khan, who st stood against uh, the British as well. So the the idea about Sufi people that they are like oh the dervishes who just dance around and they're wish flashy and they're they're not practical. No, it's that's that's absolutely not true. Maybe there is a little bit of people who come out dancing in the on YouTube, and that's our idea about them. But the real Sufis are practical, uh, are very beneficial to the world. Thank you so much, Narishia. So basically, you're saying that Sufis are following the Sunnah of the Prophet, like any other believer of Islam. Absolutely, uh, we cannot we cannot we cannot separate Sufism from Islam. I mean, there is now the new age Sufism, who thinks that uh, Sufism predates Islam, which is uh, another form of, of uh, colonization. It's, it, it, Sufism never predates Islam, and it's kind of excuse me for the word stupid because like they have their silsila or their chain traced back to Muhammad, but then they claim that it predates. <laughs> so like, um, but no, Sufism, Sufism is absolutely 
Islam and it's Sufism is not different. Um, yeah. Jazakallah for clarifying. And now we are moving into the topic that you have started, which is the misconceptions. There are so many misconceptions that surround any diversity within Islam, the same as with Sufism. So please help us to dispel some of these misconceptions today. Well, um, um, I might, I'll, I'll talk about the teacher a little bit <clears throat> and the potential of abuse that can happen there. The essence of the path means navigation, navigating the uh, external, the greater path within the inner path, right? So inner path, it would be Sufism. Uh, <clears throat> the tariqa, the order, emphasizes on a living lineage that can be traced back, directly back to the Prophet, This living chain of transmission, uh, um, their masters, um, who go back all the way to the prophet, um, and 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 the way with the prophet, the way with the that it, it used to happen in in the old days, the companions of the prophet um, saw the prophet, and they day to day like they were be corrected. So it was like a a a, a path with a living master. The, pro the prophet was amongst them, right? Um, so he used to correct them um, constantly. Now we have this chain of masters that you can trace their lineage all the way to the prophet. And now we need this sheikh or murshid uh, to teach us, right? Uh, the the thing here, if you have a teacher of hadith, there is not there there is not much of room for abuse. Like a teacher of hadith, or a teacher of fiqh, or a teacher of Quran. But once it comes to the spiritual matter, you need to interact with that teacher. I mean, if you do a bayah with a teacher from afar and you listen to him or her, you know, through YouTube or that's that's a blessing. That's okay, but to be corrected directly, you need to have that intimate relationship with the teacher, and that's great. But it also like can can leave uh, um, can leave you exposed to this teacher, and it, you can be manipulated if the teacher is not the proper teacher. Um, so yeah, we we do hear lots of stories about. The, the abuse from teachers. And, well, I, I don't know what the solution would be for that. Yeah. There is another thing that um, usually uh, it's mis misunderstood about Sufism. It's uh, the grave worshiping. And Sufi Muslim shrines are absolutely like uh, when when people think that we worship uh, our saints or shaykhs, it's incorrect and false. Uh, a real Muslim wouldn't even do a sajda to the Kaaba if the intention is it's not for Allah, let alone worshiping or doing a sajda for um, a human being. Um, it's it just like as it's just like similar to where when you go all the way to the prophet and just pray next to Rawda Raka, to Rakaz, we do the same in the shrines, in the graves, but we don't, Sufis never worship the, um, the saints or sheikhs. Yeah. Yes, such demonstration. Are you going to continue or should I move to the next question? There are so many misconceptions, right? I'm, it's wonderful that you have clarified some of them. I just wanted to bring out one point that I have always heard about Sufis really focusing on promoting love and nonviolence in society. Could you say a bit more about that, that aspect of Sufism? I mean, that's one of the reasons they were able to spread Islam, really. We believe Allah exists in all of his creation, whether nature or another human being who practice another religion or believe. 
uh, and also we we believe Sufi believe that they 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 are not entitled to judge anyone as because they don't know what's really in their heart. And also we like the Sufis would respect the timeline of each one of each person journey. So usually it's something that Sufis cannot change. They wouldn't judge it. They wouldn't, uh, they would help. And um, also Allah is the Rahman al Rahim. So they try to embody Allah's mercy, mercy in, in their every every day life, right? Um, yes, they would uh, they wouldn't be they wouldn't take the violent path unless they are uh, protecting themselves. Thank you, Narishia. So I have heard Sufis use the term Allah beloved, and then I've also heard some people ask that why do Sufis use that term for Allah, whereas it is not one of the 99 names of Allah. So how would you explain that? Um, so Allah has 99 names, right? Um, <clears throat> the hadith of the Prophet says uh, Allah has 99 names. Whoever count them or learn them would enter paradise. But the names are actually limited to the 99 names um, they and that's and that's uh, agreed upon with the majority of scholars not only Sufi scholars I mean all the sect of Islam uh, they agree on that actually let me there is a hadith uh, the dua of uh, the anxiety but I'm going to just quote a small part of that so there is the dua that Allah, the Prophet taught to us. So Allah, I am your slave. It's the part that concerns me here is, I ask you, right? I ask you by every name belonging to you, which you have named yourself with, or relieved or revealed in your book, or taught to any of your creation, or you have preserved in the knowledge of the unseen with you. So there are so many names, whether in the book or the unseen, or Allah would only uh, to, to his own creation. Um, and and um, uh, for example, a name like Yashafi um, <clears throat> is an uh, all healer. Um, yes, we do go to the doctors, we go, we take medicine and all. But then the ultimate healer is Allah Shafi, right? So this name is not from the 99 names of Allah Shafi, but we use it uh, when we pray to Allah. Um, the beloved, um, especially Sufis, we, you just said that they are promoting love and uh, they think uh, all varieties of love, like the you, uh, person experience, like the love of the, ma the mother for her child, uh, our love for our partners or for the nature or whatever is actually a reflection of Allah's love. So the ultimate beloved is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautiful explanation, Larishia. So those who identify as Salafis have not always got along with Sufis, to put it mildly. <laughs> Could you explain some of that tension or, I mean, what is the reason for that clash? <laughs> um, sure. Um, first of all, we need to acknowledge that both Salafi and Sufi were in, in, on a good terms together. <clears throat> and the intention, the tension, it's a recent thing in the history. Uh, there, there's no doubt that there are some Sufi who uh, innovate some practices that does not belong, belong to Islam and rather sometimes contradict Islam, for sure. Uh, so, and, and the Salafi are against these practices. The, mis the mistake Salafi people do is that they, they judge the whole Su Sufis, they judge Sufism instead of judging, you know, those, uh, you know, few people, right? And Sufism has like, I don't know, 900 tariqas on orders in there. Like we can't just 
generalize that. And on the other side, if we are to think about it, like uh, Salafi, there is people among them who branched into ISIS or branched into the uh, jihadi movement and they are corrupting the word and terrorizing the, you know, we can't judge Salafis with that, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's just like the genera generalization of generalization of um, of some some act of some Sufis that does not really represent Sufism. So it is basically a misunderstanding of thinking that a few people represent everyone. So as happens with most misunderstandings. Thank you so much, Narishia. So you just mentioned tariqas, and if you could explain a bit more about the different Sufi orders and how a little bit about how they were formed, that would also be helpful. Yes, uh, you mean tariqa? So um, it's kind of naturally formed with, with each saint and his own practices. Uh, this sheikh or saint or teacher wouldn't, you know, come up uh, with practices that is not from the Quran and Sunnah, but would choose and emphasize on on some of them, right? Like, for example, the Rumi would emphasize on all they love, uh, ayahs and, and Ibn Arabi would be more intellectual. Um, and then the tariqa is what, what the sheikh would create for his seekers. Um, and the practices that will will give to to his uh, marids because student. So it's basically like a training ground, a syllabus <laughs> given by a teacher to Absolutely. students. That's, yeah, that's okay. well said. Yeah, different types. <laughs> but like you said before, you know, all of this is within the Islamic framework. It's following yes. the Sunnah for Prophet peace be upon him. But just emphasizing on one thing or the other that. That yeah, individual I mean, might need. True. I mean, mm -hmm. actually, with even the teacher abuse, how do you recognize a false teacher? It's like to see his pra her or his practices, if they are um, in align alignment with the Quran, then this is a good teacher. If otherwise, just help yourself and run away. <laughs> yeah. Tasatkala Narishia, we have now reached kind of the time that we had allotted for your direct presentation. And so for our audience, thank you so much for listening. Please do put your questions in the chat so we can ask Narishia. And meanwhile, while that happens, Narishia, any other information that you want to give us, any resources to learn more about Sufism, please do share those. Yeah. Um... I mean, really, for English speakers, any work of William uh, Chick, how to pronounce that? Chick Tick? Chick -tick? I will write it down. Thank you. Do you recommend his books? Yes. Oh. And Oh, you put a link there. Thank you so much. And what about people who have questions that you want to ask someone directly? Are you open to questions Absolutely. since you're part of our community? Hmm. I can share my email. Your contact information here. I'm going to scroll up. I think there were some questions earlier on that I didn't get to. I think we covered that what makes someone a Sufi, right? What is the difference between a Sufi and a Sunni? So a person can be both a Sunni and a, Shu a Sufi at the same time, right? Uh, can you... Can I'm sorry. Me? Yes, sorry, wrong I'm time sorry. to ask questions. I'm going back to the earlier questions that people put in the chat. And one question was that, is there any difference between a Sufi and a Sunni? 
as long you're practicing on your inner journey, you don't have to label yourself with either, really. Uh, it's really, it's really working on your inner. Uh, that's what, what Sufism is all about. So if one joins the Sufi order, would they then use the name Sufi for themselves or would other people call them by that name? Or is that also kind of a private thing? I think, I think it's not, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't say it's appropriate to, for one to call themselves as Sufi. Calling oneself Sufi is like, would you walk around and say to people, yes, I am an enlightened person, thank you. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, but of course you can call someone Sufi. It's actually a term you use to call other people, right? It's, it's just like how you, you wouldn't um, kind of call yourself uh, uh, amazing or beautiful, but you're feeling comfortable calling other people with that, right? It's something, something that should be given to you by other people. And usually we we'll describe it, uh, use it with, um, you know, shape and people who really, really work on themselves, not, you know, whoever just, you know, did a vicar group. Pops up, right. And so earlier on, you mentioned about the enlightenment, how that was sparked by many Sufis, right? You said most of the Muslim inventions could be traced back to Sufis. So at that time, I was wondering that did those people identify as Sufis or did people identify them as Sufis? Or you mean, also, you mean, yes, also what characteristic do you think makes people who are inclined towards Sufism more creative or inventive? Okay, so uh, tracing, you mean the sheikhs on the, trans, on the silsila? So remember you were talking about the contributions of Sufism to the world and you mentioned that the mentions that were done, most of them can be, yes. So that yes, was what yes. I was referring. So uh, people would aff affiliate with, you know, an order, right? So like, um, for example, I'm from Shadiliya. I wouldn't call myself Sufi, but certainly I have a Sufi practices that I do every day. Uh, I can call those people who, you know, um, can contributed to the Islam with Sufism uh, because they they are affiliated with either, um, you know, Akhtariya, Shadiriya, Qadiriya, one of these orders. That's how I, I, I was able to recognize them. Jazakallah, dear. And I have so many questions myself that I'm going to exhaust you. My next question is, you said you do some Sufi practices. So could you share one or two of those? What are those practices, if you don't mind? No, um, sure. <laughs> so usually uh, a sheikh or sheikha would, you know, a teacher or a teacher would, you know, assign uh, practices that fit your, what you need, right? And um, it's, it's not favorable to share it with people, um, but the general practices would be uh, dicker or fasting certain days. Uh, so it's really not different, right? Uh, but uh, just share mine, but going back to the contribution of the Sufi people, and this is what I like, uh, how how they create like how how they gave Islam work. It's like the teacher would ask them like we we travel around and go to Spain, Andalus, or um, or Egypt, or and we see all these beautiful mosques or like well uh, the gardens or you know uh, the practices that was given to them. It was like the sheikh would ask them to do a worldly thing using their inner practices, right? That's why like this mosque is so beautiful. Like they need to manifest their inner work into a worthy um, object. Like when they, when, when an architect would design a mosque, he would design it and Allah would see that in his mind. So the excellency, uh, like would be at it's like the bar would be so high like he wouldn't 
give it to, you know, as, uh, he wouldn't, you know, rep just represent it to the people. Like he would work on that uh, masterpiece of a mosque as, a, as if Allah is going to see it, right? And so, yeah. I actually have a, a friend, an artist friend. I don't know if she's on here or not. She, she paints walls and, um, uh, and so every type of fresh or dots she draws, like there's a certain vicar her teacher gave to her. And so this is, this is some of the type of practices. That is so beautiful, Narisha. So it's like a form of mindfulness, right? As a person is doing something, they're being extra mindful of the presence of Allah and yeah, the witnessing not, of Allah. It's to not, so it's to not separate Deen from dunya. Like it's not like when you pray the five salawat, the five prayers, namaz, uh, you need to have your body and your heart together. And also when you clean the dishes, you still need to you know invoke and to recite and so you can clean them and as a, yeah, like with that excellency that's so beautiful narisha jazakallah it reminds me of the when we read the duas that our blessed prophet recited while doing everything that's what we see in them right he's remembering allah glorifying allah with every single thing that he's doing yeah so i oh, please go ahead yeah, that's actually a very concept in Sufism. Worship Allah as if you see him. And then now like every breath you take, like when 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 do when does one like really um feel their breath? It's either they are like panicking of, or <laughs> over something, or uh, um like it's it's except for Sufis, like you need like to just be mindful of, of, of every breath, which is hard to do, but one would aspire, right? Oh. Thank you so much, Narishia. I feel like I learned so much from you today, and I know how hard you have worked to put this knowledge together, right? And uh, I don't see any more questions. Is there any final thought that you want to share with the group today before we let you get some rest? No, oh, Habibi, just like Allah khair. I, you did mention something about Rumi. Um, I love Rumi and I love Ibn Arabi even. <laughs> but I just need to mention, uh, maybe talk a little bit about Rumi because he's more famous here in the West. Uh, I, think, I think his story uh, with Shams is more appealing to Western, Westerners. Um, I just feel like um, every time you mention a Rumi, and this is to clarify about the Rumi a little bit, so I, otherwise I would need another hours to talk, right? But <clears throat> um, with the Rumi, when we mention a Rumi, the first thing comes to 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 the mind is the whirling der dervishes dances or the love poems. And I think uh, Rumi is way more than that. Um, Rumi, to know Rumi really, I mean, the Rumi, let us not forget that he's a teacher of fiqh, a teacher of hadith, a teacher of liter literature and so many other uh, religious science, religion science, honestly. Um, and his main work is the Matnawi, uh, the, the couplets. And in my, my opinion, the couplets are, I would, add, I would, I would describe it as um, the um, spiritual uh, dimension, like, uh, counter, con, um, I would, in my mind, it's like, uh, I would uh, describe it as the spiritual um, interpretation of the Quran. All the stories uh, and the wisdom is kind of, just explaining the Quran in a spiritual way. Um, but I would, uh, yeah, read more about the Rumi from Matnawi than his love poems. Um, also, I think every, every American house I, I've been to who has the work of Rumi, 
is it would be a, a translation of Coleman, uh, the the translator. I think his name Coleman something. I can Barks. I think. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> a little bit about this guy. He does not speak Farsi nor Arabic. Uh, and he's and he's um, kind of whitewashed the Rumi uh, and erased any Islamic trace in his work and made him appealing to all you know to the just the Western Westerners whether they are Muslims or not. So for example, he would use if a Rumi said Salat al Fajr, the prayer of Fajr, he would call it the morning meditation or if you would uh if the room would say fasting ramadan he would call it uh, practicing hunger for discipline or he would use actually the word uh, temple instead of uh, the word temple of, instead of mosque and so just recycle his books <laughs> that's only i mean to be fair to the Rumi, honestly Hmm. I do think that um, while you're saying he wasn't true to the original, but maybe that helped more people be attracted to Rumi, but you're saying, you know, it's, that we're not getting his true spirit. That, yeah, I don't that think it's, it's not authentic. And yeah. so do you recommend a certain translation that is better than Coleman maybe Barnes? Maybe start with the Matnawi, the main volumes of, um, of, of the uh, Rumi. I don't, mm -hmm. think, I don't think he did translate that. He cannot. It's a Quranic <laughs> work. Uh, um, but I can send if, an email with more resources. I did not prepare that. Jazakallah, dear. That would be really helpful. Yes, I would be very interested. Thank you so much, Narishia. This has been a wealth of information that you have given us today. May Allah help us uh, all to learn from each other, to keep our hearts open to each other, to be united and to not fall prey to all the misconceptions that are out there and to try to verify anything that we hear from somebody that we know and can trust. And we're so grateful that you have done this for us, Narishia. May Allah bless you. Thank you, everybody, for participating and giving us some of your valuable time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.